following program, Search the Scriptures, is brought to you by the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. Speakers are Keith Sharp and Trevor Campbell. We invite you to call or write the church to submit questions for the speakers to answer. We'll provide answers from the Bible to your questions. Trevor, was the church an afterthought in the mind of God? Oh, I believe the Bible teaches it was not. Okay, I agree with you, Trevor. We'll talk about that this evening. Good evening. I'm Keith Sharp. I preach at the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. You're watching Search the Scriptures. My partner on the program is Trevor Campbell. Trevor, please introduce yourself and the brethren in Piatt. Well, sure. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, my name is Trevor Campbell. I do preach over in Piatt. Worship with a group that meets there on Highway 62 on the north side of the highway in Payette, right next to the Dollar General. And the phone number you see on the screen is my number. You can call me there if you have a question you would like to submit for the program or if you have a question about the church that meets there. The number there is 870-435-2737. And we meet on Sunday mornings if you're in the Marion County area. Come out and join us for worship. Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. is a Bible class where we can openly discuss God's Word and ask questions, make comments, and you're, you're welcome to discuss uh, different topics that we cover in that class. And then at 10.45 a.m., we have our worship service. So if you're out in the Marion County area, again, come and join us. And, of course, I preach at the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. And we invite you to our services also if you live in Baxter County. You folks over in Marion County, be in touch with Trevor. And, and get out and visit with them at the Pyatt Church of Christ. If you live in Baxter County, uh, we invite you to the Highway 5 South Church of Christ for our worship services. We have Bible classes for all ages at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. At 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, we have our worship assembly, and then we come back together again at 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. We have a Wednesday evening Bible study and worship assembly at 7 o'clock. We also have a ladies' Bible class at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning that you ladies are invited to, and I believe that you would be very benefited by coming to that. Now, to get to the Highway 5 South Church of Christ, turn towards Salesville off of the Highway 62-412 bypass, and you'll travel one mile towards Salesville, uh, and you'll go past Good Samaritan on the right, then look on the left. You'll see the sign for the Highway 5 South Church of Christ. So we invite you to the services there of the Highway 5 South Church of Christ. If you have a question for us, now we, the, the subject matter on this program is generated by questions that those who watch the program give us. And so we're dependent upon you for the subject matter. We don't come up with our own subject. Now they have to be Bible subjects. We're not going to discuss politics. We're not going to discuss health matters. We're going to discuss what the Bible teaches and particularly what the Bible has to say pertaining to our soul's salvation. Now, if you have questions along that line, then you can call me, Keith Sharp, at 870-321-5746. If you prefer, you can email to keithsharp2021 at gmail.com, or if you would prefer, you can write a letter to Search the Scriptures, Box 263 in Mountain Home, 72654. Let us know what your question is. Well, Trevor, we do have a question for the program, and that question is, was the church a second option from God because the Jews wouldn't allow him to establish the kingdom? Well, Trevor, tell us about that, please. <laughs> well, yeah, let me start off a little bit, uh, talking a little bit about the church. Um, the church was never a second option. It had been always planned and always purposed from eternity. Uh, God had planned for the church. And one of the passages that I go to for that would be in Ephesians chapter 3. So you don't have to just take my word for it. Ephesians chapter 3, is, I think, is an excellent text for that topic. And beginning in verse 8, it says, To me, and it's Paul talking, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now, the, Paul talks a lot about the mystery that was hidden from the ages, and that was because the things that God accomplished in Jesus Christ, it was unclear what was going to take place throughout the centuries. Mankind was unclear, so were the prophets of God, for that matter. They didn't understand fully what was to come and what God would accomplish in Jesus Christ. And furthermore, 
I believe that Satan also, the Bible teaches us, I believe, was completely unaware of what God would accomplish in Jesus Christ. In verse 9, he says, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which was from the beginning, oh, excuse me, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's a couple of very important words there. He does speak of the church and God's wisdom being manifested and made known to, to principalities, to powers, even in the heavenly places, he says. And he, he talks about it as the manifold wisdom of God, the many-sided, many-colored uh, that's a unique word there in the Greek language uh, to talk about just how vast and wonderful God's knowledge, his wisdom is, and his foreknowledge and forethought. And then he says, it's all in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose. So God had purposed the church in the context there from eternity, long before the earth existed. So no, the church was never a second option. It was God's purpose and plan throughout eternity to have a, a people, to have the church. And in the context here, you know, he talks about it as being a mystery that had been hidden from the ages. And, and I said that I believe it was hidden from Satan as well. You know, you can go to Luke chapter 22. When Jesus was being arrested, and, and the, the men came to arrest him from the Jews, and he said to them, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Satan was involved in the crucifixion and the arrest and crucifixion and persecution of Jesus Christ because it had been hidden from him what God was going to accomplish through that death and through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But God had purposed all of these things and planned all of these things ahead of time. And one of the things I want to bring out, Keith, is I want to go back to the Old Testament for a moment. Now, these, this text, I'm going to go to two different texts, do not deal with the church specifically, but it does talk about God's plans and purposes. When God plans or purposes something, there's nothing any man or any group of men can do to stop it or to hinder it, or, or to any way, you know, make it change. Going back to Isaiah chapter 14, this is an interesting text. This is Isaiah chapter 14. This, in this context, is a familiar text to a lot of people because the name Lucifer appears. And a lot of people think Lucifer is Satan. If you look at the context very closely, it is not Satan. It is simply talking about the king of Babylon. And in the context here, Isaiah, God is prophesying through Isaiah, the end of the Babylonian Empire. Well, this is interesting because the Babylonian Empire has not reached its height yet. In fact, during the time that Isaiah is prophesying, the Assyrians rule over Babylon, rule, rule over the Chaldeans. They're not even the world empire yet. But yet, in the context of chapter 14 and 15, or actually, excuse me, 13 and 14, God speaks of this glorious city of Babylon and how Babylon is basically ruling over all the earth. And here he talks about their king. Well, then in verse 24, The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and on my mountains tread him underfoot. Then his yoke shall be removed from them, and his burden removed from their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed against the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? You know, God's point is, and God brought all these things to pass, breaking the Assyrians. He also brought about the end of, of Babylon and its king, and that can be uh, you know, seen even in secular history as well as the Bible. But these things all came to pass. God says, if I purpose it, it comes to pass. If I think it, it's going to happen. And so we can see that nothing can stop his hand from, from doing as he wishes or he wills in the earth. Another text, just briefly, in Isaiah 44. In Isaiah 44, this, in the same type of history, uh, deals with Cyrus the Persian and the, the beginning of the Persian Empire. But in chapter 44 and in verse 44, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who has formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by himself, or by myself, who frustrates the signs of the babblers and drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolishness, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers. Now those are his prophets, his messengers. And, and God foretold things concerning the church, concerning Christ, 
and concerning the kingdom of God back in the Old Testament days, and he brought all of those things to pass. So in the question, I believe the part of the question was, you know, you know, was the church a, a second option because the Jews would not allow God to establish a kingdom? Well, no one withholds anything from God. No one stops God from doing what he purposes and plans to do. And I believe the Bible teaches very clearly in one of those texts, is Ephesians 3 there, that God had always purposed and planned not only for a kingdom, but also for the church. All right, Keith, I'll kick it over to you. Thank you, Trevor. Appreciate that. Uh, I want to give just real briefly the background of this question, where the question comes from. Uh, there is a theory that is extremely popular today uh, among fundamentalists. In fact, uh, this is one of the things that makes a, a denomination, a fundamentalist denomination. And that is that uh, the, the Lord has uh, some dispensations, uh, seven dispensations in all, and we're in the sixth one. Uh, and, and then the seventh dispensation will be the era of the kingdom, but the sixth dispensation and the fifth of the dispensation are the, is the time of the church. And so they make a distinction between the church and the kingdom. And they teach that uh, when Christ came to this earth, he had planned to establish the kingdom, but the Jews rejected him. And they use Matthew chapter 12 as their key uh, chapter. By the way, it is true there that the Jewish leaders did reject Jesus. But the question is, did that keep the Lord from establishing his kingdom? And are the kingdom and the church separate things or the same thing? Actually, the Lord knew full well what the Jews were going to do, anticipated it, and simply did not allow them to do it. In Psalm 2, David prophesies the Jewish rejection of the Messiah, the Christ, and how God would react to that. Look at Psalm 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 and make a few comments. The second Psalm. Why do the nations rage? Now the nations there uh, is a, a term that sometimes is translated Gentiles. These are the non-Jews. And so far as the days of the Lord, that would be the Romans. Why do the nations rage? And the people, now the people here are the Jewish people. So here's the Romans and the Jews acting in concert, acting together. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth, the rulers, and that of course would include Pilate, that would include the rulers of the Jews, it would include even the Caesars. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, so it's against Yahweh, Messiah, Je excuse me, Jehovah, the Lord, God, and His anointed. Now, the word anointed there, and I have a footnote in my Bible to this effect, but the word anointed in the Old Testament is the word Messiah. It's against the Lord and His Messiah, God and the Christ and saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Don't let them rule over us. We're going to destroy their rule. So they were plotting against the establishment of the kingdom. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Watching this was something that made God figuratively laugh at puny people trying to thwart his plans. The Jews and the Romans together could not thwart or frustrate God's plans. God knew what they were going to do. He prophesied through David what they were going to do. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet, now look at verse 6. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. God knew what they were going to do. And he said, I'm going to crown the Messiah as king anyway. What they're going to do will not prevent me from crowning the Messiah, the Christ, as king. And then he says in verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. So he tells him who he's talking about. He's talking about the Christ, the Son of God. When God raised Jesus from the dead, he raised him to sit on David's throne. And that's what he did. 
In Acts chapter 2, I want to read verses 29 through 36. Acts chapter 2, verses 29 through 36. Peter is the speaker. It's on the day of Pentecost. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried. His tomb is with us to this day. Now he just quoted from Psalm 16 where David says, you will not allow your Holy One to seek corruption. My soul will not remain in Hades. And, and uh, here Peter is saying, he's still dead. His tomb's right over there. You can look at his tomb and you tell that audience of Jews on Pentecost in Jerusalem. And so the point is, David wasn't talking about himself. David was still dead at the time that Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost a thousand years after David lived. Therefore, being a prophet, that is, David was a prophet. And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that is, in, as is recorded in 2 Samuel 7, God swore and gave an oath that he would take his seat and set it on his throne. Knowing that uh, God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseeing this. Foreseeing what? Christ sitting on David's throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. God raised up Jesus to sit on the throne of David. Verse 32, This Jesus God has raised up, of which we, the we are the apostles, are all witnesses. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. What promise? That he would be raised from the dead to sit on the throne of David. Christ received the promise when God raised him from the dead and he sat him on the throne of David where he rules and reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. He pouring out... Uh, he. Uh, let me back up to verse 33. Therefore being exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured out this which you now see it here, that is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. For David not ascended to the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Christ sitting at the right hand of God as King of kings and Lord of lords on the throne of David, which is the throne of God. That was the fulfillment of Psalm 16. It was the fulfillment of Psalm 2. Either, either Christ now rules and reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords, or He has not been raised from the dead. Now, which will you accept? I believe He's been raised from the dead. And I believe he's seated at the right hand of God as King of kings and Lord of lords. And his kingdom and his church are one and the self-same thing. The kingdom is the church from the standpoint of its rule. The church is the kingdom from the standpoint of the people who, who are the inhabitants, are the citizens of that kingdom. The word church means assembly. One other passage, I'm going to turn it back to Trevor. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, Peter, or excuse me, Jesus is the speaker. He's speaking about Peter. In Matthew chapter 16, he'd ask the disciples who they thought the Son of Man was, and, and they gave various answers. And then Christ asked, Who do you think that I am? And Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus blessed him. And then he said, I also say to you, I'm in verses 18 and 19. Of Matthew 16, I also say to you that you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. It is the rock that Peter confessed that Christ is, that Jesus is the Christ. That's the bedrock foundation of the church. And the gates of Hades should not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus didn't build one building, the church, and give the apostles the keys to a different building, the kingdom. That's one and the self same thing. He's using the phrase kingdom of heaven interchangeably with the word church. The church is the people. The kingdom is the rule. And when Christ 
established his church. He established his kingdom. They're one of the self-same thing. And as Trevor has well pointed out from Ephesians chapter 3, rather than the church being an afterthought of the mind of God, the church is the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose for the salvation of his people in Christ Jesus. All right, Trevor, I've said enough. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Right, you know, you had, uh, you had brought up uh, Psalms 2 there, and uh, I, I immediately thought of Acts chapter 4, where in the context of Acts chapter 4, Peter and John had been arrested. Uh, well, actually, I think they've been arrested chapter 3, but they uh, had been arrested because of preaching the name of Jesus Christ and because they had healed a man uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. And so they were threatened, and then they were let go by the Jewish authorities. Well, if you pick up the story in verse 23 of Acts 4, it says, And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And now they're going to quote from, the, from Psalm 2, which uh, Keith read for us earlier. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. That's his anointed, as I believe Keith pointed out earlier. In verse 27, for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. I want to take us back just for a moment uh, to the beginning of the study. I took us to a couple passages, Isaiah 14 and Isaiah 44, God talking about his purposes and his plans and how he stretches his hand out over the earth and no one can, can pull his hand back. No one can annul the things that God chooses to do. Well, take a look again in this text here where he says in verse 28, they did, and, and God used evil men who were making evil choices, but he used them to bring about his purposes, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, back in the text of Ephesians 3, we saw that from eternity, this had been purpose. It was an eternal purpose of God to bring forth this kingdom, to bring forth the church of Christ, Jesus Christ. And there in verse 28, these folks were simply God's tools to, to bring about what he had always planned and purposed. So all those events, and that's something I think that a lot of folks have trouble with, and, and, and I've struggled with myself, but the idea that God uses evil, evil men and men who make evil choices uses those choices to bring about his plans and his purposes. But that's what the Bible teaches, that God does these things. Now, there's another text that this is going to relate to what, uh, Keith, you brought out in Acts chapter 2, where it talks about Jesus being seated at the right hand of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, this brief text, Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul is talking about the mighty power of God. We're coming into the middle of the sentence, so that's why I'm saying that in the context. The mighty power of God. Verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Or in the heavenlies is the more accurate translation. So in that text, just like in Acts 2, Peter said, God has raised him up. He's seated at the right hand. The, the idea of the seated at the right hand is the idea of the place of highest honor. And that's what's being spoken of. Christ has been given the highest honor. And that fits the context here because as you continue to read, in verse 21, he is far above all principality and power and might and dominion. Well, all of that to me speaks to his, his rulership. The fact that he has a kingdom, that he is king, that he is Lord in Christ, and he's far above all these individuals, principalities, powers, any kind of authorities in the earth or even in the heavenly places. He's above all these, above all might and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And God put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. So there we see the kingdom, the church, all being spoken of, God's reign, the reign of Jesus Christ, his reign and his rule, and also that he is head over what? Over the church. Yeah, because the church answers to him. He's the king. He's the head over all things to the church. He is the authority. We go to Jesus Christ, we go to his apostles and his prophets in the first century to find out what we're to do as God's people. And that's what we're to do. In verse 22, and he put all things, oh, I read that, verse 23, which is his body, that's the church, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So 
Christ is the head of the church. The church is described in the book of Ephesians by Paul as the body of Jesus Christ. But he's the head. He's the mind. And he has the control, and we answer to him. And so by just looking at those two texts, we see that Jesus Christ is reigning and ruling according to God's purpose that he had planned from eternity. And he used wicked men to bring about his purposes and his plans. But his plan was executed according to the purpose. And then there in Ephesians 1, Christ is Lord. He's king. He's above every name that is named. And he's above all principalities and powers. So he has the rulership. He has the kingdom. All right, Keith, I'll kick it back to you. Very good, Trevor. Now, the question was, is the church an afterthought in the mind of God, something that God did not plan originally? And Trevor gave, I believe, what is the basic passage to establish the truth of that matter in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. It's the, the church is the fulfillment of the eternal purpose of God for the salvation of his people. And as we've tried to point it out, rather than being a difference between the church and the kingdom, it's just the same entity from two different viewpoints. The kingdom is the viewpoint of the rule. It's the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Christ, one of the self-same thing. Or from the standpoint of the people that compose it, it's the church. The word church means an assembly. It's a called out assembly. And so it's the same thing. When the Lord establishes church, he establishes kingdom. And it's that which he planned from all eternity. It's not any afterthought. It was God's original plan. I want to give one other passage before we run out of time where the terms church and, and kingdom are used interchangeably. In Hebrews chapter 12, the inspired writer is telling us what we've come to when we've come to the new covenant in Jesus Christ. He's writing to Jewish Christians, trying to get them not to fall away from Christ and to return to Judaism. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 23 says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. So in coming to the new covenant, among other things that he lists there, they've come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn ones. Now, skipping on down to verse 28, same context, still talking about the same thing. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. In coming to the new covenant, in coming to Christ, in becoming members of his church, we come to the kingdom which cannot be shaken. It's a king, and by, the, by the way, that's the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 2. After the, the fourth kingdom of, of, that was represented by that great image, after it was destroyed, then that, that stone that destroyed it became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And Daniel said in Daniel chapter 2 verses 44 and 45, that's a kingdom which is eternal. It will never be shaken. That is, it will never be taken away. So the eternal kingdom is the church that Jesus built. If you by faith are baptized into Christ and become a Christian, you become a part of that church. Then you become a part of the eternal kingdom. It's not, a, it's not an afterthought of the mind of God. It's the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose. Thank you so much for watching this evening. Thank you for watching Search the Scriptures. If you have a Bible question or comment, you may call 870-321-5746, email keithsharp at suddenlink.net, or write Keith Sharp at P.O. Box 263, Mountain Home, Arkansas, 72654. And your question will be answered on the air. Be sure to watch next week at the same time for another edition of Search the Scriptures. Until then, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.